This question comes from Jason Rothman of Oklahoma City, who was the first shareholder to ask a question that subsequently was framed by a number of other shareholders as well. In my mailbox, this was the most popular question asked. Mr. Buffett, you state in your annual letter to shareholders that in your will, you have given instructions to the trustee who will be acting for your wife's benefit to put 10% of the cash given her in short-term government bonds and 90% in a very low-cost S&P 500 index fund. My question is, why are you advising the trustee to put 90% of the cash into an S&P 500 index fund instead of into Berkshire shares? Nope. This might imply that you expect the index fund to outperform Berkshire in the future when the company is run by a new CEO and chairman. Please clarify. Yeah, I'll be glad to clarify. That, that letter didn't come from Vanguard by any chance. <laughs> the, the, uh, when, I, when I die, incidentally, the, all of the Berkshire shares I have at that point will go to five different uh, foundations, every single share. I mean, there, there are no shares that have not been designated uh, mentally and, uh, to charity. A good many have been designated specifically to, in numbers and all of that. But, and they will, be they will be distributed over the 10 years after my estate is closed. So figure over 12 years. And I tell, my, I tell the trustees that, uh, that will be holding these shares, you know, don't sell any Berkshire shares until they have to be sold. So my views on Berkshire, at least through 12 years after my death, are as bullish as anybody could possibly come up with. And incidentally, without those kind of instructions, anybody would say, you, you know, you're crazy to keep many, many billions of dollars all in one stock. I can't think of anything better to do it over those 12 years. In terms of, of my wife's situation, you know, that, I, that is not a question of maximizing capital. It's just a question of total 100% peace of mind uh, on something that cannot get a bad result. Uh, and uh, well, like I said, there's way more money for her than she'll ever use. As a matter of fact, those of you who know her you know, may feel that I've added about three zeros too many. Uh, but it, it, it is not designed for her to get even larger amounts of capital. And there'll, there'll be capital left over on that part of it. Uh, on the part that I care about maximizing, uh, I have been instructed uh, the three trustees to not sell a single share uh, until it has to be sold. So that's, that's good for 12 years after I die as to my best advice as to what I want them to hold. Charlie? Well, Warren is a little peculiar in the way he distributes money in the family. And I think he's entitled to do what he damn pleases. <laughs> speaking, do I, speaking, do I hear my children Mother, applauding? Do I hear my children applauding? <laughs> and uh, I've never had this feeling I had to starve the family, get down to a few trifles. And Warren really. And Susie, when she was alive, was the same way. He really is a meritocrat. He, he, he's really quite extreme in wanting to let most of his money go back to the civilization in which it was earned. I like being associated with it. Oh. Mr. Buffett. This is a question about Berkshire's holdings in Coca-Cola. This spring, Coke asked shareholders to approve a magnanimous stock option program for its executives. Asked about it by the press after the vote, you said the program was excessive. Yet you did not tell the world prior to the Coke shareholders meeting that you believed the program to be excessive a disclosure that, had it been made earlier, might have made shareholders vote against it. And in fact, you did not vote Berkshire's shares against the plan. You only abstained in the voting. I guess you had your reasons. 
I must say I don't expect to agree with them, and I cannot see how they can stand up under examination. But I still would like to know why you engaged in this very strange, unbuffet-like behavior. So why did you abstain rather than voting no against a corporate action that deserved to be shouted down? Yeah. Well, some people incidentally think that strange and unbuffet-like uh, unbuffet -like are, are really not quite right. That's as strange as frequently buffet-like. Uh, the, um, the proposal uh, was made uh, by a shareholder who had owned shares for a long time and uh, uh, was opposed to the, uh, to the option program. Uh, his calculations, and I probably should have it, but his calculations as a dilution were wildly off, and uh, we did not care to get into a discussion of that or anything else. Uh, but we did talk, or I did talk, uh, to Mutar Kent, and I informed him that we were uh, going to abstain. I told him that we admired enormously the Coca-Cola company, we admired the management, and we thought the compensation plan, although it was very similar to a great many plans, uh, was excessive. And uh, Mutar and I had a very good discussion right here in Omaha, as a matter of fact, as well as a couple of telephone discussions. And then immediately after the vote, I announced that uh, we had abstained and gave the reasons that we thought the plan was excessive. And uh, I think that in terms of having an effect on the uh, Coca-Cola compensation practices, as well as maybe having an effect on some other compensation practices, that that is the most effective, uh, was the most effective way of behaving for Berkshire. We made a very clear statement about about the uh, about the uh, excessiveness of the plan, and at the same time, we in no way uh, went to war with Coca-Cola. We have no desire to go to war with Coca-Cola, and we did not endorse uh, some calculations that were uh, wildly inaccurate and uh, and uh, joined forces with uh, someone that I had really no contact with. I mean, I, I received several letters in the mail after they'd first been given to the press. So I, I think you have to be, I don't think going to war is a very good idea in most situations. And I think if you're, if you're going to join forces in going to war with somebody, you better be very sure about, uh, about uh, uh, what that alliance might mean. So I think the best result for the Coca-Cola company was achieved by our abstention. And uh, uh, we will see what happens in terms of compensation. Uh, between now and the next meeting of Coke. Charlie? I think you handled the whole situation very well. <laughs> and Charlie remains vice chairman. <laughs> I, Charlie, Charlie, incidentally, uh, was the, Charlie was the only one with whom I talked over the, uh, the vote. Uh, before or, or the abstention before I did it, I called Charlie and uh, told him about the plan, and uh, uh, and we agreed on on the course of action. But, uh, I should I, I should point out one thing, I, and and in fairness to David Winters, who may who led the war, uh, he took figures from the Coca-Cola proxy statement, so it's hard to fault him for that. Uh, but for those of you who would really would like to know how to think about calculating dilution. Uh, Coca-Cola has regularly repurchased the shares that are issued uh, through options, uh, and the share count has thereby come down just a small bit at Coca-Cola, not anywhere near as much as if they hadn't issued as many shares, though, and repurchased shares. But Coca-Cola has a, has a plan that involves 500 million shares, uh, and they say in the annual report that they expect to issue these over approximately 
four years, and then they have a further calculation between performance shares and option shares, but I'll leave that out, uh, make this a little simpler. Um, and that's a lot of shares. Let's assume for the moment that Coca-Cola is selling around $40 a share now, which it is, and that, when the, and that all the options are issued at 40, and that the, when they're exercised, we'll say the stock is $60. Now at that point, there has been a $10 billion transfer of value, $20 a share times 500 million shares, a $10 billion transfer of value. Now, the company, when that is done, gets a, a tax uh, deduction and at the, uh, up for $10 billion, and at the present tax rates, that would result in $3.5 billion of less tax. So if you take $20 billion of proceeds from exercise of the options, and you add three and a half billion of tax savings, the Coca-Cola company receives 23 and a half billion. And if they should buy in the stock at $60 a share, uh, which it would be selling for then, they would be able to buy um, 391,666,666 shares. So, uh, in effect, the Coca-Cola company net would be out a little over eight, 108 million shares, and that's on a base of four billion four. So the the dilution, assuming all the all the proceeds from the option exercise and the tax refund were used to buy shares, the dilution would be 108 million shares on 44.4 billion, or about two and a half percent. And I don't like. I don't like dilution, and I don't like 2.5% dilution. Uh, but it's a far cry from the number that we're, we're getting tossed around. It's a long explanation, but I've never seen the math exp written about. I mean, I've seen people throwing out claims and all of that. And you can change my, my supposition from 55, 60 to 55 or 65. It doesn't change things very much. <laughs>